job is stepping out to catch the honky tonk blue. All right, for the majority of the rigs that we'll be selling, I'm gonna be using this nine to 11 ounce holster strap leather from American Leather Direct. It's a tannage that's specific for molding and stamping. Works really great for straps, belts, holsters. I'm just gonna use one of these standard strap cutters. Super easy to use. I'm gonna set it at three inches for the gun belt. Decided to cut a few of these out while I'm at it. But before I run out of space, I'm gonna cut a couple half inch straps and a three quarter inch strap for the cartridge loops. So then I'm gonna take this pattern that I made and cut out the holster. So I can just flip this pattern uh, frontwards or backwards depending on whether or not it's left or right. This is for a right hand draw, so it'll be this way. So I'm using what's left over from the hide that I used to cut my straps out. And I'm kinda on the tail end of the hide here. A lot of this stuff is pretty low grain and nasty and I don't wanna use uh, most of that up here. There's some kinda nasty scarring right here that I'm gonna try and avoid and then also be kind of strategic. Like this part right here will be the front of the holster that's gonna show the most. So I want that part to be really clean. And so I'm going to put it right in between these two bad spots. And this section will be on a part of the hide that's underneath so you won't, you won't even see it. I'm gonna use a scratch out to make the marks for where to cut. I'll make the marks for all the holes that I'm going to punch. These are the little holes that the lace is going to go through for the uh, hammer thong and the leg tie. I'm going to use a bigger knife to just cut out the basic shape of the holster. I know this seems kind of wasteful, but you need to be able to rotate the holster around to get around those tight corners, especially on thick leather like that. So there's gonna be about an inch and a half of leather around this whole thing that technically will go to waste, but this is kind of a rough spot of the hide anyway that I wasn't gonna get much use from. I've been trying out a few different cutting techniques for cutting out holsters. Um, this is really thick leather. This is nine to 11 ounces, vegetable tanned, it's holster leather, so it's pretty dry. It's not easy to cut through. Um, but with all the tight corners and round shapes, uh, it's a lot easier to go around and kind of score the outline of the holster with a precision knife like this. Um, and then once you get that top layer cut, I can go through with a curved blade like this and kind of saw through it. Um, maybe eventually I'll get really comfortable with just sawing the whole thing out. But as for now, I really like getting a nice precise cut first takes twice as long, but um, you know, I'll probably evolve and get more comfortable with that later. So with this one, I'm not pushing super hard to cut all the way through it. I'm just cutting the top layer, probably cutting only about halfway through the hide. And then when I run through it with the other knife, it kind of guides it through, makes it easy. So if you decide to put a liner in the holster, this part's not so difficult because you'd probably start out with something lighter weight, like a five to six ounce, and then line it with like a three to four ounce. In this case, I'm just doing it one layer of leather for both the belt and the holster.
I love these one and a half inch round strap end punches for just about everything. I think it puts a really clean finished shape on the end of most straps, even things uh, smaller than one and a half inch. In fact, I like the shape a lot more than using this on an actual one and a half inch strap because it makes it almost too round. I kind of like the more subtle round shape that it gives to smaller straps. Pretty clean. So I'm gonna start making the cartridge loops first. I've got a couple different patterns here that I can use. This one's in 22 LR, and these little half inch oval punches are about three eighths of an inch uh, apart, and that puts the loops really close together um, after you lace it through. And I like to use about five to six ounce leather for the base and the loops, or like four, whatever. Four, five, six will work out pretty well, but anything thicker than that, and you would have a pretty hard time lacing this through. For this belt, I'm gonna make it in 45 Colt. This is 18 loops. This is a two inch wide base. I like to weave the cartridge loops through a base like this first, just in case I mess up and then I'm not screwing up the whole belt. And then whatever caliber is ordered for that belt, I can just sew on and have it done ahead of time. So it'll be pretty helpful, but you can just punch the holes right into the belt you're making and lace it through there. So I've got the base with the holes marked, but I'm not actually punching them yet because I need to skive this piece down. I cut this out of 9 to 10 ounce heavyweight leather and uh, it makes it really hard to weave the leather through when you're dealing with really thick leather, especially on the actual part that you're lacing through. I would not recommend 9 to 10 ounce for the ammo loops. So I'm going to use my bell skiver and take this down from about... 11 ounces and I'm gonna try and take it down to about five. So this is a console DCS-S4. Uh, it's really not meant for heavyweight leather like this. It's really good for like wallets and bag parts, um, taking stuff down from like five ounces down to two ounces, that kind of thing. And because this foot is so small, you really only have about an inch worth of skiving. So I'm taking a piece of scrap leather. I like to test over and over before I take it to my real work just to make sure we got it down. So, I don't know where it's at right now, but let's just try it out. Oh, it's not working. All right, so if I kind of pull it through, I can get it to skive a bit. That took us down from 11 to 10. I'm gonna push the stone a little bit closer to the blade so that it actually pulls it through and drop it down just a hair. I'm dropping it way down. Let's see how it goes. We're down to nine. Down to eight. I'm gonna go way down here. There we go, that took us down to six. So that's probably just like one or two more steps away from getting us where we need it. That's step five and a half. That would probably be good for the base. about six ounces now. We 
We just went from 11 ounces down to about six and a half. Gotta keep going. All right, that puts us at about four and a half on the strap that we're gonna lace through for the ammo loop. So I think we're ready to punch some holes and start lacing it through. So when I'm using the weave method for my ammo loops, I like to have at least four times the length uh, for your strap so that you don't run out of room. Because you don't want to be weaving through, then you get to this point, you run out of strap and have to start all over again. It's a huge pain. So we've got one, two, three, four, and a little extra. And um, that's about the full length of the hide that I had. It's like 50 inches or something. So um, that's why you want to always make sure that when you're starting out with your straight cuts, you have a really long piece to work with. So as I weave this through, I'm gonna use a little sponge and some water to keep it wet, just like, you know, six to eight inches at a time as you're working it through. As long as you're using vegetable tan leather like this, especially stuff that's good for molding, uh, this is holster strap tannage from American Leather Direct, but anything like natural tooling will be really good for uh, locking these things into place. So you wanna make sure to get it wet as you're working through it loop it through and yank it tight, it's gonna really lock in and uh, stay there forever. So the good news is you don't technically need a rivet here to hold this in place, because as soon as I get past the first loop, it's gonna lock in pretty good with the water. But just for a little extra security, I'm gonna throw a rivet right here in the end. It's also kind of decorative. I don't know, those two little rivets look kind of nice and add some flair. So I'm gonna throw a rivet in here and then get it wet and we'll start weaving it through. All right, so I've got my strap wet, and I'm going to start looping these through. You feed it up through the hole and then down through the same hole, like this. And then as you go to cinch, cinch it down, I learned this on Sam Andrews Custom Leather watching one of the Hank Strange videos, but if you give it a really good yank, it locks it in really nice. And I've had good results with getting really nice tight loops by doing that. Make sure that the straps on the back side are laying down nice and flat. Back down. All right, then I'm just gonna keep weaving these through till I'm all the way to the end. There we go. I'm just gonna get all these little loops wet down just a little bit more just so that they can really lock into the place they're in. And now I can go throw a rivet in on that last spot, trim the excess, and then we can sew this onto the main belt.
So now I need to measure out the length of the belt. I've got the buckle side cut out and I need to now punch the billet side of the belt over here. So with leather that's nine to 11 ounces thick, I like to add six inches to the overall length of whatever their waist size is. So for me, just as an example, I wear a 38 inch waist. So I cut mine down to one, two, three, four, five, six, right at about 44 inches instead of 38. The reason for that is you have to compensate for the thickness of the leather, but you also have to realize that these belts are worn around the hips, not the waist. So most pants sit at the waist right about here, where a gun belt is gonna hang a little bit lower down here. Also, it's kind of typical for gun belts, uh, especially the Western style ones, to hang a little bit loose and, and hang down just a little bit, kind of crooked. So you want quite a bit of extra room in there to breathe. But I also punch seven holes, so I like to get that middle hole as accurate as possible, but then you still have a lot of flexibility room to cinch it up tight or let it loose on the end. So this belt is for a customer with a 38 inch waist, ironically, same as mine, but I'm not actually keeping this one. So I'm going to put the center hole and bring you back over here. On the buckle side, I measure from right about to the end of the long side of the oval hole punch, just because that's, I just happen to know that's where my buckle ends. But as a rule of thumb, you usually measure the belt on the buckle side from this point, right where the tongue meets the end of the buckle, because that's right where the hole will be sitting. Um, a lot of people measure it from where the leather wraps around the bar, but then you're actually missing out on about three quarters of an inch to an inch, depending on the buckle um, in length. So measure it from that point, right where the tongue meets the buckle. And with this specific buckle, I just happen to know that it's it sits right at about where that oblong hole punch ends. So I'm gonna put my ruler right at the end of that hole punch. I'm gonna come over here, and here's the 38 inch. That's like the customer's standard waist size, like what he would order his pants in, for example. And so from that, we can get a pretty accurate sizing by adding on six inches to any leather that's about 10 to 11 ounces. So we're gonna go one, two, three, four, five, six. Puts us right at about the 44 mark right there. This hole with the dotted line is the middle hole, so I'm just gonna line that up with the dot I just made. That's only about a couple inches short of the maximum length I could get in a belt uh, with this hide. But of the few hides I've had in this same tannage, that's uh, pretty accurate to what it is normally. It usually sits right around 50, 55 inches. I like to get this curve cut out first on the taper before I attack the straight edge. So I'm using a 3 16 inch punch. I got this punch set from Weaver. But 3 16 of an inch seems to be a pretty decent fit for belt buckles. All right, before I start beveling this stuff, I'm going to uh, go take this over to the sander and clean up some of these cuts. Some of it's just a little bit rough in some areas and uh, I can kind of even things out. And when you sand, you actually mushroom out the edges, so that's the perfect time to hit the beveler after you've sanded.
So I've got 80 grit set up on that sander, but then I'm gonna go back over it with a 320. This is just something really fine to kind of clean it up and uh, get rid of a lot of the fibers that were sticking up. All right, I'm gonna use a quarter inch round punch for the two holes right here because both of these have two uh, layers of lace that come through for the hammer thong. And then down here I'm gonna use 3 16 of an inch because it's only one lace will go through each hole. All right, I'm gonna place the cartridge loops about where they go so that I can line up the gunfighter stitching template. This is a template that I made. I'm gonna find my middle point right here, inch and a half, about right there. My next middle point, about right there. I'm gonna line up those corners as close as possible and then make my mark with a scratch all. This stitch is just purely decorative. It's definitely something that adds time to it, but because this rig is so simple as it is, I like to add just a little something to give it some style. So my burnishing process for these belts are pretty simple. I'm just using a little water. You could also use like tokenol, saddle soap, something like that. But uh, water always works really well for me. And then I'll follow it up with some beeswax. But that's it.
All right, now that I've slicked it all down with water, I'm just gonna go over it with a really light coat of beeswax just to kind of seal it up. And uh, after that light coat, I still do a quick burnish and rub it down with this canvas just to heat it up and get it to kind of um, just kind of melt into there and really seal it up good. So I've got most of the edges burnished on the holster. Uh, the only edges I didn't need to do are these ones right here and right here because it eventually will be folded up and stitched and then I'll be sanding that down and burnishing it all over again. So I don't need to worry about that part, just the parts that I won't be able to get to once I stitch it. Unfortunately, the area that I cut this holster out of as well as the uh, front strap were from a kind of a low grain area of the hide. And I even knew that a little bit going into it, but I didn't realize it was gonna be this bad. But when the leather's really low grain and loose, it gets really hard to burnish. I don't know if you can see it, but uh, it seems like the more I burnish, the more the loose fibers just pop up and it just looks worse and worse the more I go. And that's really frustrating because the, the bell ended up burnishing really nicely just super glassy, really tight grain. So um, I know that it was just the part of the leather that I cut this out in. If this was gonna be one that I would sell, I'd probably recut the holster out. But since I've gotten this far for the video, I'm just gonna keep it going. So if you notice some loose grains popping up and uh, kind of a messy edge, that's why. But this thing's gonna turn out awesome anyway. So, so now the next step is to fold it over, glue it, stitch it, and uh, just start assembling this thing basically. That's for the holster, but as for my belt, the only thing left to do is to sew on the ammo loops. I've been letting these kind of cure and dry as long as possible because I'm going to have to take the rounds out in order to sew it, and I just wanted them to stay in there while it was drying just so it could keep its shape and look good. But uh, I think it's ready now. I'm going to pop it out, sew it on, and then probably put them right back in. But before I do, I'm just going to do a really quick burnish on this edge because it's going to be up against the leather you'll see any of the fibers really easily so it's not a it's not super important but since it will show we'll clean it up luckily this was definitely from a better part of the hide so it should slick up really nicely Since this leather is pretty smooth, I'm going to use a detail rougher. Um, you can use this on areas where you're going to use adhesive on smooth leather and it'll make the adhesive stick a lot better. Basically just scratching it up. So I don't want to put this stuff on too thick because then it just makes it take forever to set up and dry. You can even use a spatula like this just to even it out and break up some of the big globs.
Before I make the stitch on the holster, it's good to flatten out this edge right here because you don't want to punch the needle through on an area that's uneven. You might be coming off on the edge, if that makes sense. So I like to get a perfectly flat edge before I stitch. Because I used contact adhesive, it should stay together pretty well and we can get a flat edge before we sew. Alright, that's pretty flat, so we should get a nice even spacing on the stitch on both sides and then after we can bevel and burnish, make it look really nice. Alright, I'm going to run my stitching groover down the side of this so that I can get a nice even stitch and know right where the start and stop points are. I'm using this hot plate to heat things up a little bit. Water works a lot better um, molding veg tan leather if it's a little bit warm. Uh, you don't want to do it boiling because then it'll just crack and not good for the leather. But, but we'll get it just a little bit warm so it just really permeates the leather and works well. So once that water's warm, I'm going to dunk the holster and it'll be time to mold it. Like I've said before with uh, Western, like late 19th century uh, style holsters like this, uh, they weren't bone molded like modern holsters are today for everyday carry. Uh, they were actually a little bit more of a loose fit, especially for like fast draw. You don't want any resistance coming out or going in. I have a 1873 single action army mold that works really well. This is definitely like a great option because you can just stick it in and leave it. You don't mold it or anything, just leave it in there. 
and it'll get a really nice fit. But for my taste, it's just a little bit too snug still. It kind of locks in just a little bit, even with the dowel for the sight and everything. So I decided to take some wood and sand down just a little uh, gun mold for myself. I based it off the measurements from the blue gun, but I just made it a hair wider and it's just a little bit smoother. It doesn't have the same jagged edges. When it goes in, it opens things up and it'll keep it up and it also gives like a nice smooth um, look to the holster. So this is something I'm testing out. I've only used it once and I uh, didn't get to like really give it a good shot. So it was kind of just a crappy test, but this will be, um, you know, a good test for it. We'll see how it works. Okay, so our water's pretty warm. I don't have any running water out here in the shop or else I'd fill this up a little more, but fill it up another time. So I'm just gonna dunk it and use the mold and see if we can get a good fit on this thing. Definitely need a bigger pot. <laughs> so I'm gonna be doing more of these. Okay, that should be good. I'm going to use this with the plastic baggie around it just so it doesn't warp the, the wood. And I'm just going to go in slow. One of the main reasons I wanted to use this wood is because when I use the blue gun, it kind of scratches up the interior. And by the time I'm done fitting the holster, uh, the, in, the interior of it already looks like it's been used and abused. And I kind of want to avoid that if possible. I want these to come off looking brand new. Right here on the throat, I'm going to just slightly open it up. Going to place the gun back in the holster, it catches on that a lot and that just makes things a whole lot easier and smoother. All right, I'm gonna try and line those two bottom holes up as much as I can and then get us a good fold right here. like to go in just a little bit more because that trigger guard needs a little space to open up. There we go, that's a little bit better. Everything seems to be looking pretty good. And I think I'll just leave it there overnight. For this heat imprinter, I just made a few jigs over here to help me know right where to place stuff. So for like for a vertical wallet, I can place the piece in there and know that it's gonna stamp in the right spot every time. Uh, with this one, it's a little bit trickier. It's a little bit more vague, but with this piece of leather butted right up against the back of that, and this one right there, it helps me know that that should be the perfect center point for uh, that stamp once it's warm. Now that the holster's all dry, I'm installing the lace for the leg tie and the hammer thong. And then I can assemble the front strap and put it on the belt.
So that wood mold worked pretty well. It's a pretty loose fit, still a little bit of resistance. Other than that leather turned out to be real nappy, um, you know, I'm gonna really watch out for that for future holsters, make sure I'm only using really tight grain areas of the hide like this. The belt turned out beautiful. Left my home down on the rural route. Told my baby I'd be stepping out to catch the honky tonk blue. Yeah, yeah the honky tonk blue. Good Lord, I got a, I got the honky tonk blue. Well, I stopped into ever joining town. See that life is all it got. Down. I got this honky tonk blue. The honky tonk blue. Hey Lord, I got a room. I got the honky.